Welcome to the Be The Change podcast with your host, Ralph Harper. On this podcast, he shares his vision for the future of the United States. Think of this podcast as somewhat of a roadmap to times in the future on a continuum from a dark past to the 2060s. Yep, that's right. He's a forward thinker whose purpose is to dictate positive outcomes for our children and our country versus leaving it all to chance. Ralph will cover parenting, fatherhood, accountability, and what it takes to win in this great nation. It's not just Ralph. He will have difficult conversations with other thought leaders of different backgrounds and political affiliations. It's time to get started. Here's your host, Ralph Harper. Hello and welcome to Be The Change Podcast. The title of this episode is The Audacity of Fatherhood. Today I'd like to put fatherhood and fatherlessness into perspective. The true measure of a father is ultimately determined by the level of respect he earns over a lifetime from his son or his daughter. In this regard, my theories are based on two factors. First, my experience with my father growing up in the South in Birmingham, Alabama, and second, the role I played as a father, which I decided to write a book about. The book is titled, Stepped Up, The Urgency for Fatherhood. As a lot of you may know, the topic of fatherhood is one that few people want to talk about or engage in. It's one of those issues that has a way of slipping in and out of mainstream conversations. Unfortunately, the conversations are rarely sustained long enough to yield any meaningful outcomes, the kinds of outcomes that may be necessary to be impactful. A few years ago, when Oprah Winfrey came to Dallas, Texas to host a fatherhood conference, primarily focused on fatherlessness, I attended the conference. And quite honestly, I was, I was hopeful and it turned out, though, that more people seem to be more intrigued by, by Oprah than they were about taking steps to address the issue of fatherlessness. And I will admit, I may have been one of those guilty parties. Needless to say, since Oprah's stint and her attempt to address fatherlessness in the United States, there hasn't been much traction. And consequently, the issue of fatherlessness persists. Several years ago, I decided to paraphrase one of Theodore Roosevelt's most famous quotes as a way to put fatherhood and fatherlessness into perspective. The quote is titled, The Man in the Arena. The credit belongs to the father who's actually in the arena, the father who strives valiantly and knows the great enthusiasms and the great devotions and spends himself in that worthy cause of being a father. The father who at his best knows the triumph of greatly achieving as a father. And the father who at his worst, if he fails, he fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid fathers who neither know what it's like to win or fail as a father. Theodore Roosevelt's quote covers accountability in a general sense. My paraphrasing of Mr. Roosevelt's quote hones in on fatherhood and the accountabilities linked to fatherhood. So from this passage, I have determined that there are three levels of fatherhood. There is the triumphant father or the exceptional father. There is the daring father and there's the timid father. The exceptional father is the father who gets it right. The daring father is the father who does his absolute best. Sometimes he fails, sometimes he succeeds. But the timid father is that father who has the audacity 
to abandon his child. In my lifetime, I have had the pleasure and discomfort of meeting all three levels of fathers. A few days ago, I was in the gym with a close friend, Dave Edwards. We were having our normal chat about current events and Donald Trump and some other things. And I got to a place where I decided to remind Dave of my plan to have a group of people at my house to discuss our children and a plan I have to ensure they reach the 2060s with enhanced life outcomes. He's very familiar with my plans and my mission. But then he also reminded me that I have told him about this several times and I've never pulled the trigger. We laughed about that, but I'm closer to a place now where I'm ready to have some uh, a, a broad group of people over to my house just to have this open discussion. And so as we started talking and we're trying to figure out dates, um, I suggested uh, the upcoming Saturday. And Dave was quick to tell me, he says, well, that won't work because my daughter has a soccer game that I have to go to. If it's after 6 o'clock p.m., then maybe I can make it, but otherwise I will be at my um, daughter's um, soccer game. And so we tried a few other dates, and um, it came out that uh, um, Dave had other plans with his, with his other kids. And so we started to just try to work through that and work around it. Um, but I, I started to sense something about Dave. And I started to realize some of the other conversations that we've had about his kids and his wife and his family and what they do and how they sit at the table each night and have dinner and so on and all these other things that families and fathers and fa uh, families and fathers should do. And then we started talking more about his daughter and his so and her soccer game. And he was I could see in his eyes that glow when he talked about how fast she was and how she's um, um, she plays uh, the goalie sometimes and then she plays a different role and she's really good one of the top players on the team and he was stoked about that he's just stoked about his daughter in general and I so respected that I so respected that because he was all into it and somehow the conversation shifted to education and he started telling me about his plan that he and his wife has for their daughters and and and, and his kids to get them through college and so on and um but it wasn't one of those conversations where he was frustrated about having to do it. This man was very excited about uh, being a father and playing that role and the assurance that his kids will be okay as they matriculate through high school and through college and through the rest of their lives. Those are the stories that intrigue me when it comes to fatherhood and I quite honestly, I consider uh, Dave to be one of those triumphant fathers. Dave is like my brother, Fred. My brother, Fred, is also one of those triumphant fathers, I believe. I received a phone call from him a few years ago. He was excited about the fact his son, Jordan, had, re had received a letter from the Department of Education. The letter indicated that Jordan had won second place with his creative writing out of close to 320,000 students around the country. The letter was also inviting them to attend a ceremony at the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. And we talked about that on the phone for 40 minutes, 50 minutes or so. Both of us were very excited. And in the process of just having that discussion with him, I was already online trying to figure out, well, how can I find a flight to make um, this event, there was no way I would miss it. And in the end, we all met, the, th the three of us met in Washington, D.C. We attended the ceremony, and we stayed a few extra days just to uh, experience Washington, D.C. Um, it was great. We had a chance to bond and just to talk about um, Jordan and, and his accomplishments and to talk about his future as well, and I'm so proud of him. And I can tell you unequivocally that uh, my brother Fred and his wife, Yvette, have just done an exceptional job with their two children, um, Jordan and Julian, and um, I consider them to be that exceptional family, and I consider my brother to be that exceptional father. 
But let me switch gears here for a moment. After months of going back and forth about whether or not I would write a book about um, my relationship with my um, son, Cody, I finally decided to sit at my desk in my office and start writing the first chapter. I had completed an outline, but I decided to start writing the chapter. And in that first chapter, I found myself immediately denigrating my father for not being close enough. First of all, we were in Birmingham, Alabama, in tumultuous Birmingham, Alabama, back in those times in the 1960s when things were not so good for people like us. It was my mother and my father and me and my nine siblings living in a three-room house and I was too young to even understand or have any appreciation for what my parents were going through. But when I started writing this book, I started denigrating my father and I, I, I just wasn't being very nice in that chapter. And as I sat in my desk in my office, I had this epiphany. And I sat back in my chair and then I decided to stand up in my office I walked out of my office through the door and I went down the hall and I walked into the kitchen in my home. I walked around the island and then I came back to my office and sat back in the chair and leaned back and the epiphany I had was that I realized that my father never abandoned me. I realized that, yeah, my father wasn't perfect, but he never abandoned me. But the bigger picture reality for me was the fact that I have absolutely no idea what it feels like for your biological father to abandon you. But I imagine it must be painful knowing that your biological father has the audacity to abandon you. That reality hit me. It hit me hard. And before I finished that chapter, things changed and I found myself praising my father for staying because he left me with some memories of him comporting himself as, as my father and father to my other nine siblings. I have that memory of him erecting a basketball goal in our backyard and showing me how to shoot my jump shot, teaching me that. And that's why today I have that, that, that Allen Houston style jump shot where I elevate completely before I release that shot and it works every time. Well, not every time, but most of the time. I have those memories etched in my head. Those, those little things that my father did, I have those memories in my head and there's no way for them to dissipate. There's no way for them to go any place. And the reality in our country is that there are so many kids who don't have those memories with their biological father. And it's one of the saddest things that I can imagine. My father wasn't perfect, but he was there. He was there during some, during some pretty tough times and he stayed. And when my mother decided to divorce him after 25 years, he moved around the corner. And each day when he got off that bus coming from work, working at the post office, he walked past our house and sometimes he'd stop and come in and just to spend a few minutes with us. But we always got to see him. They called him Papa Hopper. Yep, Papa Hopper is what they called him. Not anyone in our family, but everybody in the neighborhood called him Papa Hopper. In any case, after I left Birmingham to attend Talladega College, I remember coming home one summer and my father was at the house uh, one day after work and he's just hanging out with, with, with everybody in the house. And he called me outside and he says, hey, listen, I, got, I have something for you. I walked outside with him and he gave me this crisp $50 bill. That was a lot of money 
for my father to give to me because again, we were in Birmingham, Alabama in a time where um, black American people weren't doing so well, especially if there were 12 people in the family. But I accepted that $50 bill and over the course of the day, I spent a little bit of it and um, a couple of days later, I was sitting with my mother and I was talking to her and we were just having a normal, casual conversation in the den, which is typically what we did. And I just asked my mother, I said, so mom, how are you doing? And she says, you know, I'm okay, but your father shorted me $50 on the child support. I was dumbfounded. I was shocked. I was so disappointed because I knew that my father had given me that $50 bill which should have been a part of the um, child support that he should have given my mother. In that moment, in that very moment, I knew that I would confront my father. So I went outside early and I sat on the stoop at our house so that I could wait for him to leave that bus station and pass our house. And that's exactly what happened. I saw my father walking towards me he had his little hat on his head and I was sitting on the steps waiting on him. And I stood up and I stood in front of my father and I weighed maybe about a buck 52. And I knew I was going to say some things that weren't so nice to my father. And I stood in front of him and I was ready just in case he decided to punch me in my chest and knock, knock me out cold. But I had to say something to him. And I told my father about the $50 and... I said to him at one point, at one point during that conversation, I told my father how disappointed I was in him. I said to him, if this is how you plan to support me by taking away from my, my brothers and my mother, I'd rather not have your support. I told him again, I was disappointed in him. My father looked at me with this blank stare. I could tell that he could see that this young child had grown up to be a grown man willing to stand up to him. He looked me square in my eyes. He never said a word. My father finally, after staring at me for a while, he finally looked down to the ground. He looked at me again before he turned and simply walked away. He never said a word to me. He just walked away. And I just went back inside. There was nothing more I could do. But then the next time I came home, I was in the house again with my brothers. My father came in and just as before tapped me on my, sho on my shoulder and told me that he had something to talk to me about. And I said, okay. And he asked me to come with him outside again. And we went to the side of the house this time. And he gave me a crisp $100 bill. And I told him, I'm not going to accept that money. He says, no, I want you to have this money. And then he says, I'm going to give you this money as well. This is a child support that I, I'm supposed to give your mother. I want you to give it to her because I don't want you to think that I'm pulling that old trick again. Here's your $100 bill. Here's the child support money. I want you to give her that money. Then he asked me to count the money in front of him so that we were both on the same page and, and clear about the fact that he wasn't trying to pull that same kind of trickery he had pulled on me previously. And so I followed his instructions. And there it was. All the money was there and I had a crisp $100 bill, I decided to accept that money. And I accepted it. I accepted the money because I could tell that my father was trying to make things right. And um, I didn't want to get in his way. I didn't want to block his blessing. So I accepted that $100 bill. And uh, later that day, I gave that money to my mother the way my father had instructed me to. And... Um, 
from that point on, my, my relationship with my father improved. Um, we talked a little bit more um, when I came home from school. Um, things were things were just very different from that point on. And I will never forget that particular experience. Um, it's something that just told me a lot about the character of my father. Again, my father wasn't my father wasn't perfect. But he was there. After attending Talladega College for four years, the time came for me to graduate. I had anticipated the event for a long time. My mother was there. My Aunt Elma was there. My sisters were there. Some of my other brothers were there. And um, I was excited. But uh, I didn't see my father. And I quite honestly wasn't sure if he was there or not. But I wasn't phased by his absence. Um, I was excited about the fact that I was graduating from college. And um, uh, the time came when we were all standing in line and our names were being called and my, my classmates were, uh, who were ahead of me were going on stage to receive their diplomas. And um, I stood in line and as I came closer to the stage and got to a place where I was actually walking up the steps um, to experience uh, my delivery of my diploma. I saw through the periphery of my eyes a struggle going on on the opposite side of the stage. There was security and, um, and there was another person that they were talking to. And it seemed to me that the conversation was pretty intense. I had no idea what was going on. But I wasn't so much concerned about that. I was, again, excited about just walking across the stage to receive my, um, um, my diploma. But as I walked up a few more of the steps to get to the stage, and my name was probably the third next to be called, I looked across that stage, and the person they were talking to happened to be my father. My father had literally penetrated the security rope and was standing at the bottom of the stage, at the bottom of the steps and near, near the stage, talking to these security guys. And the conversation went on for a few minutes uh, as the president continued to call, call the names of the individuals who were receiving their diplomas, uh, my classmates. And then, then I noticed that my, my father had apparently been successful in his negotiations uh, the security guys had apparently allowed him to stand at the bottom of the stage um, to wait. And he was there, and I realized that my, my father was actually there waiting on me to walk off that stage. And it was such an emotional thing for me to, to witness. Um, I had never seen my father so eager to um, be a part of anything that I had done. Um, but it was exciting. It was exciting to see my father first at the graduation. But moreover, my father had taken this extra step. He wanted to be at the bottom of that stage. And I assumed he wanted to send a very clear message to me about um, his pride. And, um, and so I was excited about it. And as I walked across the stage, finally, my name was called and I walked across the stage I received my diploma with my left hand, I shook the president's hand with my right, and I continued my stroll across the stage and started to walk down those steps, and there he was. My father was standing right there, waiting on me to come off that stage. And as I took that last step, my father embraced me, he held, held me tight in his arms, and he said something I quite honestly don't believe I had ever heard him say before. My father told me he loved me. And then he told me how proud he was of, the, of me for graduating from college. And then he whispered, he says, your education is the one thing no one will ever be able to take away from you. I returned the favor. I told my father I loved him. I told him I appreciated the fact that he was there to experience that moment with me. 
Then we both stepped back from our embrace, putting some distance between us. And I could see my father's eyes and I could see that tear fall from the wells of his eye, his left eye. And then I could see two additional tears fall from the wells of his right eye. I had never seen my father cry before. We both cried. Then the security guy reminded us both that it was time for us to move on. So I went back to my seat and my father walked on into the distance. I didn't see my father much after that. As it turned out, um, I wasn't successful finding a job in Birmingham, Alabama, and I made a decision to accept a, uh, uh, the offer from uh, Equitable Life to uh, head back to New York to work there in a permanent job. And so I did that. And I guess a few years later, my, um, my father uh, passed away. I guess he knew that um, um, his drinking was catching up with him. And maybe that's why he wanted to uh, spend that quality time with me. I'm not sure. But my father died at an early age, way too young. He was 52 years old. My father was daring. He dared to stay married to my mother for 25 years, for as long as she would tolerate him. And when she decided to divorce him, he dared to stay in the neighborhood so that he could have access to her and to his 10 children. He dared to do his part as much as he could to support us in those turbulent times and in that turbulent place. He dared to provide some level of support for me as I um, attended Talladega College. He dared to stand down in the face of my disappointment. Then he dared to stand up and wait for me on the opposite side of the stage at the bottom of the steps so that he could embrace me and congratulate me on my accomplishment. You see, that's what daring fathers do. They do as best they can. They stay in the arena, but they don't abandon their children the way timid fathers do. After my book stepped up was published I decided to do a brief tour um, it wasn't much of a tour but I, I visited places from San Mateo County in California to Florida Gulf Coast uh, University in in, um, in in Florida and um, I got to experience uh, different levels of fathers I got to experience um, and have conversations with um, you know triumphant fathers. I got to meet additional daring fathers. Um, but it, it was interesting because I, I didn't have a chance to meet that many timid fathers. And I, I guess it's pretty obvious why, because they just aren't around. And if they are around, they're not necessarily willing to admit that they are that father who has that thing within him to, to abandon his child. But I did meet some of their children. And consistently, those children, whether they are young children or grown adults in their 50s and 60s and 70s, the way they describe their fathers is uncanny. They use derogatory terms that I can't even use on this podcast. It's sad to witness that, but that is the reality. Timid fathers are all over the place. So let's not be misguided. You know, there are timid fathers who are just helpless and broke and alcoholics and on the streets and homeless in some cases. And maybe they have legitimate reasons for being that timid father who uh, made a choice to abandon their, their children. Uh, but then the timid father is also on Wall Street. 
there's a person on Wall Street sitting in his, in his high chair today um, with the Freedom Tower in his eyesight, knowing full well that he's wealthy and doing very well. And at the same time, mindful of the fact that he has abandoned his child. Who does that? In the months after Stepped Up was published, I just happened to be walking in Walmart, food shopping. That's what I do. I'm not that person who goes to the store on a weekly basis to buy everything that I need for the full week. And quite honestly, I don't know how to, how to do that. I'm, I'm in Walmart probably more than I should be. But that's a whole other story. While I was there this particular day, a woman approached me. She was a white woman. And um, she approached me and she says, are you Ralph Harper? And I said, yes, I am. She says, did you write the book Stepped Up? And I said, yes, I did. And I'm, I'm shocked that you recognize me. And it turns out my, my picture is on the cover of the book with my, with my stepson, Cody. But she started talking to me about the book and uh, she was just intrigued by my candor in terms of how I told um, some, I was, I was pretty open about uh, things that happened in, in my relationship uh, as I comported myself as father to Cody. And I talked about some of uh, the discipline tactics. I talked about some of the other things that happened in, in that relationship and so on. And so this woman could could sense that by, and just by reading my book and um, the way I told my stories. And she, she commended me for, for that. And I didn't think I needed any recognition for that, but she did anyway, and I, I, I received it. But the other thing she did is uh, she spent uh, some time talking to me about her father. And it became very apparent to me that her father was one of those timid fathers who had made that choice to abandon her. And she told the story of how it happened and how she was just a child when he left and she hadn't seen him in all these years and she had, has never seen him since. She was very upset about that. She was very upset. She was so upset to the point this woman who just happened to be a stranger to me started bawling in the vegetable section at Walmart as she was talking to me. That is the typical response that I have seen um, and that I have experienced in terms of my encounter with people who um, have fathers that have abandoned them. They constantly say, I hated my father. I hated my father. And then they use other choice words again that I'm not allowed to say on this podcast. But that is the way. People who have been abandoned by their, by their fathers, that's how they describe their fathers. As I said in the beginning of this, of, of this podcast, and this just turns out to be the very first sentence in the first chapter of my book, the true measure of a father is ultimately determined by the level of respect he earns from his son or his daughter over a lifetime. I may be paraphrasing my own sentence, but you get the gist of it. There's a measurement that happens over the course of a lifetime by children, and children are the only ones who get to measure the success or failure of their fathers. And trust me, they do. My experience has shown me that Children of the triumphant father consistently say, my father was amazing. My father was exceptional. I loved my father so much. And then they go into the detail of why. And like me with daring fathers, I stood here for a long time just talking about my daring father and I gave you my particular view, my measurement of my father based on how he comported himself in that role. And while it wasn't pretty, I respect my father 
it's hard to imagine a, a child of a timid father would uh, be able to say that they have some level of respect for him. So in closing, I'd like to point out some data points related to the impact of fatherlessness in terms of the economy and in terms of social concerns. Children in father-absent homes are almost four times more likely to be poor. In 2011, 12% of children in married couple families were living in poverty compared to 44% of children in mother-only families. Fatherless children are at a dramatically greater risk of alcohol abuse. Children of single-parent homes are more than twice as likely to commit suicide. Children born to single mothers show higher levels of aggressive behavior than children born to married mothers. So this dilemma presents a question of will. What are you willing to do? What are we willing to do? What is our country willing to do? I must say, I'm, I'm so proud of President Obama. Uh, and I, ha I had the pleasure of meeting him twice. And when I met him in the White House, um, I had a chance to talk to Valerie Jarrett. Uh, we stood in a corner and we spoke f for at least 20 minutes or so. I was telling her about my book, Stepped Up, The Urgency for Fatherhood, and she suggested I meet with uh, Broderick uh, Johnson, who was heading up my brother's keeper. So after my meeting with the president, several weeks later, I ended up going back to the White House to meet with Broderick Johnson. My nonprofit organization is now connected to my brother's keeper. The reason I point this out is because those kids who, uh, through no fault of their own, they are in desperate need of some level of guidance. And when I consider my brother's keeper and Yes We Code and some of these other organizations that are out there, these organizations could turn out to be the lifeline for these kids who are struggling because their parents and their, their home structures and their family structures are broken. Um, we need to do what we can to um, get at this problem. And I know that I talked earlier about the fact that Oprah Winfrey was involved before, but we need to get involved in a bigger way and we need to stay involved and focus on getting our children the information they need to be successful, especially as we move forward to the 2060s. I talk about the 2060s a lot because I, I just believe in my heart that we have an opportunity to drive the change that we need to, uh, that we, we hope will happen, but it will require us to do something. And in order to do something, you have to have the will to, uh, to be accountable. And when you consider the situation related to children of single parents and the need for them to have some level of guidance and the need for them to have some male figure in their lives to give them some example, especially young boys, then you have to ask yourself, um, you know, what part can you play? What part are you willing to play? And uh, it's important for us to, to focus on that right now because otherwise we will continue on this track doing the exact same thing and leaving our kids' lives to chance the way we always have done. And I think it's been proven that that is not working out so well, especially in certain communities. Actually, I say certain communities, but I must admit my bias uh, for the black American community. Moreover, I must admit my profound bias for black American children. The good news in all of this is the fact that I am so hopeful about the future, and I have a lot of reasons to be hopeful. One of the main bases for my hope is the fact that our country elected a black American president of the United States of America. It's impossible to gauge or to measure the profound authority, the profound power of an individual achieving that level of success in this country. 
but I can tell you, I imagine it's extraordinary. And so the thing that serves as the basis for my hope is the fact that I have actually witnessed President Barack Obama on national television say to the world that he and his wife, First Lady Michelle Obama, will be focused on this same issue that I'm concerned about for the rest of their lives. And as many of you know, this is my purpose as well. So that gives me hope that we have an opportunity over the next 50 years. And the way that I have laid this out is this very clear. Starting on January 1st of this year, 2019, that was the very first day of the 50 years that will elapse until 2019 on December 31st. That's exactly 50 years. We have 50 years to solve this problem um, that I perceive. Um, and uh, um, we have, in my opinion, the capacity to get after this and go make a difference and um, ensure that our children reach the 2060s with enhanced life outcomes. But let me be clear. President Barack Obama cannot do this alone in spite of his um, authority, in spite of his uh, level of success, in spite of his popularity, in spite of all those things that come with being president of the United States of America, he will not be able to do this alone. It will take people like you and ordinary people like me to jump on the bandwagon and play a significant role supporting the president in his quest. And I would suggest also we need to make his quest our quest so that we're all on the same page. There's a lot of work to be done. And uh, this president will not be able to stand up and just say, hey, listen, let's go make this happen. When he says something like that, then uh, if there isn't a meaningful and supportive response to his request, then we will fail. I just want to make one point before I close here. I, and again, this is my opinion. You can take it or leave it. But I just believe that since uh, Martin Luther King's assass assassination, there has been this degree of capitulation related to the black American community and this notion of us getting to a place of just being collectively successful. And we at some point have to rid ourselves of that level of complacency so that we can uh, make it happen for, if, if for nothing else, if for absolutely nothing else for our children. We have an opportunity to make this happen, and I am hopeful that anyone listening to this, and by, let me just be clear about this. I'm not just saying, hey, listen, every black person in the country needs to come together. We need every single person willing. I don't care what your race is. Uh, there is an issue that needs to be addressed with black American children, but there is an equal opportunity that needs to be addressed with certain white American children and other children in our country. And uh, the things that we're talking about, the things that I am touting, can address each and every race group. Um, and But I cannot be apologetic for suggesting my bias towards supporting black American children. Um, and I can say also that uh, I, have, I have actually heard the president say as well that his, his agenda is not just limited to black American children, but... I believe, too, that he has a certain bias about this, and I imagine that he is not apologetic about it either. So um, uh, so anyway, uh, thank you so much for coming out and listening to me again. I really appreciate each of you. I would ask you to please uh, consider forwarding this or inviting others to listen, um, and I will um, see you and speak with you next week. Be blessed. Thank you for joining us on Be The Change. Be sure to subscribe today and don't forget to rate and review so we can continue to bring you the best conversations. Visit RalphHarper.com for show notes, resources, and events. To support Be The Change, please join our patron community at patron.com forward slash Ralph Harper. Be The Change returns the same time next week and is brought to you by the 2060s Project.